I'm Tara Bench and I'm really excited to be here and cook with you today. I am the author of the new book Live Life Deliciously and we're going to be making a few recipes out of this today. This is uh, just out and I'm excited to share what's inside. So let's get started. I am going to cook cheese and herb potato gratin and we'll do a chicken and melon dish in a minute. But first of all, let's start with this potato gratin. This is like one you've never seen. Instead of layering the potatoes in a casserole dish, we're going to arrange them standing upright in a beautiful arrangement in the pan. So the first thing I'm going to do is peel my potatoes. And Melissa's, I'm so excited to be here with Melissa's. They have provided these beautiful potatoes and produce, and so we'll use those today. Um, I, as I peel potatoes, I'll tell you a little about me. I spent most of my career as a food editor in magazines, both Martha Stewart and Ladies Home Journal. And now I run the food blog called Terra Teaspoon. And so that is the name of my book, Terra Teaspoon, Live Life Deliciously, and my blog. So I have lots of delicious recipes on my blog. And so excited to have just published a cookbook. It's a long time coming and I have some really delicious things in there. It's a mix of everything. So there are dinners for busy weeknights and entertaining your family, friends, as well as desserts and breakfasts and snacks and appetizers. And this is one of the side dishes. So this take on a potato gratin is uh, sort of all about the presentation. It tastes delicious, but I'm really showing you how to take a simple classic dish and make it beautiful for a great presentation. So I am first of all doing a mix of potatoes. And I love mixing potatoes, especially for a baked cheesy potato dish and adding some garnet or sweet potatoes or yams, that color is something that is just an extra pop. So I add sweet potatoes to my Yukon Gold. You can use any other waxy potato or even red potatoes. Um, Melissa's has a gemstone potato mix and you can certainly use that. They are going to get sliced. And so I like to use potatoes about the size of my, the palm of my hand. Uh, you can also use the small ones and leave the skin on so you don't need to peel them. Uh, red and yellow potatoes have such a tender skin that they often don't need peeling when they're so small. And we're cutting them so thin with the mandolin, you'll see in just a minute that the skin, um, melts into those potatoes really nicely. So I will finish peeling these potatoes. You need about about six potatoes um, and let's see, I'm gonna check. Six small gold potatoes and then three sweet potatoes or yams. All right, I have all of my potatoes. I'm going to clean this up and wash them and be back to slice them. Okay, one of the biggest tips I have for this recipe is to get a mandolin. And that is one of these great slicing tools if you don't have one. Um, and this handy glove that is, uh, it's got metal fibers in it so it protects your fingers from the blade. You can also use the guard on a mandolin. My mandolin is adjustable, so I have it set for a nice thin potato slice. And I'm not using the guard because I have my glove, uh, but you can do either or. And my potatoes are just not quite paper thin, but they've got some movement to them. They're not thick enough to be stiff. And I love that because they sort of cook and hold their shape, but still melt into the gratin. And of course, I don't get too close to the end of that potato. Um, and you can discard the very tippy end that you don't slice. Now, could you do this with a knife? 
I wouldn't suggest it. It's so many potatoes to slice. Um, the other option, sure, is a food processor with a slicing blade. If you use a food processor, your potatoes are going to be a little thicker. Um, and you're going to want to cook it covered with the foil a little longer. And we'll get to that step and I'll tell you a little more about that. Everyone's oven is different, obviously. And so I like to encourage people to, you know, adjust cooking times and add or subtract as they go. Make sure you're setting the timer for a shorter range and checking your food as you go. So this is my first pile of potatoes that I'm going to put in my large mixing bowl. So you want a pretty hefty sized mixing bowl because we're going to toss these potatoes with some cheese and herbs and it's just easier in a larger bowl. And we're just using simple ingredients. Potatoes, a mix of cheeses, and some broth and half and half, or milk. So these are gonna be so pretty. I love adding color to a dish that traditionally might be brown, and how fun to add orange, garnet, or you know the reddish orange potatoes, especially as fall and winter come and they're much more in season. They just add that variety to the dish as you present it. So look how easy this mandolin makes this job. It goes, it takes some time. It's probably the most time consuming part of this recipe is just to get your potatoes perfectly sliced and it's well worth it. Okay, so as that gets a little tricky, I'm gonna let that nub and go. Keep adding my potatoes to the bowl this may look like a lot of potatoes, but if you've made a gratin and layered all of those potatoes, you know that it takes quite a few layers of the thin potatoes so that you have flavor in between each layer. That's the nice thing is you don't have large pieces of potato that inside might not have as much flavor. You have these thin, this thin surface area to cover with the herbs and cheese and you'll really see in the end result what that does. Okay, sweet potatoes are almost done, which I love. And then I'll finish off with a couple more yellow uh, Yukon Gold potatoes. And these are nice and buttery and smooth. I don't typically use um, a russet potato or the more mealy potatoes in my gratin. I like the buttery texture with the cheese. You certainly could. No one is telling you not to use those, those potatoes. They are great for mashed potatoes or whipped potatoes. The mealy, drier texture makes mashed potatoes so nice and fluffy, whereas um, a baked casserole type dish is so happy with um, a, a waxy or softer potato. And I simply use a regular yellow onion. You could certainly use a um, white onion, even a red onion, but it might not be. I, I like these to melt into the dish and almost be undetectable other than the flavor. Um, I do add a little garlic powder to my potatoes, but I don't add fresh garlic to this dish. I think it's a little overpowering with the nice cheese and um, different texture. So I, I skip the garlic, the fresh garlic in this dish. So we'll get that outside layer of the onion off. And this, you could certainly cut it in half moons or slices. But in a gratin, I like the onion to be, not to be kind of stringy as you bite into it. So I just cut it in, in half or in thirds and thinly slice um, through those slices. So I'm getting almost a chopped onion, but they're very thin slices right there. 
And those thin slices uh, will melt into the potatoes and almost with every bite you won't even know they're there other than the flavor. And we'll measure that. Just a little more than half a cup. But it will be so good. All right. Add that to your potatoes as well. So this recipe is so great in that you can use fresh or dried herbs. And Melissa's has sent me these beautiful fresh herbs. Um, so that is ideal when they're in season, when you can get big bunches of herbs um, to use fresh herbs. And I am gonna do that today. So my recipe calls for dried herbs. All you have to do is double the amount of fresh. And same thing, if you're doing another recipe and it calls for uh, fresh herbs and you only have dried, just use half the amount, sometimes even a third, depending on the herb, um, because they're, they're, more, they're stronger, um, and so you want that different amount. But in this, we have that uh, perfect trio of herbs. It's sage, rosemary, and thyme. And then I'm putting in a little parsley. And like I said, I'll add dry garlic instead of fresh garlic. So I'm just pulling the tough stems off my herbs. Um, now if you are a fresh herb user, here's my tip. If the stems are tender, eat them. You can totally use them. You do not have to pull every single tiny leaf off of your herbs, um, your herb stems, uh, especially thyme. The very tip of that thyme is often so tender, you don't need to uh, pull the leaves off of it. I strip my fingers down the stem of the thyme and then I just pop that tender tip off and use it. So I'm not worrying about um, getting all those little tiny leaves off. And that's my quick way of doing herbs like thyme and rosemary. Just pick through, get the tough stems off. Easy, easy. And these herbs, Melissa sent me so many beautiful herbs to use in this gratin, and I'm so happy it calls for all of them. It really adds a lot of flavor. Now the thing with using dry herbs is, this is a year-round recipe. So when, you when you're in the winter and there's not as many fresh herbs around, absolutely use uh, your dry herbs. And that's another way, do you ever fill your spice cupboard with so many spices and, and for recipes and then you don't really use them. So they kind of sit there. This is a great way to use those dried herbs and spices in the winter. Okay, I'm going to get the right amount. So my recipe calls for one and a half teaspoons of parsley, half a teaspoon dried thyme, half a teaspoon ground sage. So all of these herbs I'm going to chop and as I said, use double the amount. In my book, I um, talk a lot of the, about the presentation of food because for much of my career, I have been a food stylist. And so I make food for photography and I have to think as I develop recipes or as I go into a photo shoot, I have to think about um, what a recipe is going to look like as I cook it, as well as after it cooks. And so I give tips throughout the book about um, what to do to make a dish look a little bit better or present it on the plate a little bit um, more beautifully. And I just think we eat with our eyes, right? So <laughs> you, want, you want your food to look good as well as taste good. Okay, I am taking those slices of potatoes and sort of breaking them up. They're, they like to clump together so that I get these herbs in between each one. The onions are in there. And then I'm gonna add my cheese. Now, funny enough, we're not adding a ton of cheese. What we want is just enough cheese for flavor. So we're not making a gooey casserole. Um, we're just making a super flavorful baked potato dish. So into the potatoes, I'm going to add one cup of Gruyere cheese calls for about two cups of grated cheese. 
and I love mixing my cheese. So a cup of Gruyere, and I'm going to add a cup of shredded sharp cheddar. It can be yellow or white, it really doesn't matter. Now that we have our fresh herbs and our cheese and onions, let's add that last pop of flavor, the bits of salt, pepper, and dry garlic powder. And I'm going to put that in in a couple of batches. If you are using dry herbs, I would suggest doing that as well. Um, add a little bit, stir it, because look how much, it's so much that you really want it distributed evenly. And I keep finding those pockets of potatoes that are sticking together, easy to break apart, ready to add the rest of our dry flavorings. And you'll notice I have my hands in it. I don't mind getting my hands in the food. Clean your hands, wash your hands, and then you can really get in there. So I'm seeing that this looks pretty even. And I'm going to layer it in my pan. This is the fun part. You guys will love this technique. Now the fun part is instead of layering it flat, here is where I gather a little handful in my hands, making sure there's cheese and herbs in between each of those potatoes. And I don't care what order, it can be variegated. I'm not even bothering to do every other color. Um, that's why this is so easy to assemble. You look at it and you think, oh my goodness, that must have taken forever to lay those potatoes in that pan. Look, it really doesn't. It's so easy to gather these up. Now, as, as, as I gather, you can see that I'm kind of getting some of that cheese and the onions in between each one. I put it in the palm of my hand, sort of straighten it into a shape, and that will lay right in the pan. Now, I kind of gather it around the edge, and what we're going to do is make a spiral with these potatoes, these upright potatoes. So gather in, that was a little big, Gather in your handfuls, maybe stick a few colors in there to give it variety, and lay it in the pan. These can go in pretty tightly, because as you know, food shrinks when it cooks. So these potatoes will sort of shrink down, and so the cozier you get them in the pan, the better. That's why you think, oh my gosh, how is that entire bowl a potato is going to fit in the pan, but it does, and then it's perfectly baked at the end. Okay, that was a really yummy cheesy bite, and I'm going to squish it in so I get a last layer right around the edge of the pan. Can you see that? And now I'll start on the second row in. Um, don't worry about doing this in a cast iron pan or even in a round pan. This technique totally works for a square pan as well or a rectangle. Um, you can make it half the recipe, make it in a smaller dish. I want to encourage you to make it your own. So that's what I also love about my recipes. Use them as guides. Make them once. Uh, the way they're written so you know what the result is going to be, you know how long to cook it, and then experiment on your own. So you can see as I wedge it in the pan, it's pretty tightly wedged in there. Um, so you'll feel it as you do your own. And we'll just get those last bits in. Right now it's all about the look, it's about making it look pretty and then it will bake pretty. Does that make sense? So I'm going to, look, I've got maybe a cup of potatoes left. Easy to set aside. You can throw this in, a, in another little dish. Um, but this is pretty tight right now, so I'm not going to put any more in. What I am going to do is sprinkle the rest of those bits of cheese and onion on the top and it will create some nice, opportunities for browning. So I, I cook this with foil on it for the first about 
an hour, almost 50 minutes to an hour. And then I uncover it. And that's when those bits on the top get to caramelize and the potatoes get brown. It, it's amazing. I'm gonna go wash my hands, we'll get this in the oven. Okay, one of my tricks is I love nonstick foil. <laughs> if you can grab some nonstick foil, that will be your best friend for this dish. If not, take regular foil, spray it with some cooking spray or rub it with butter and it will go right over the top. Okay, just before that goes on the top, you want to add your liquid. This is just a half a cup of chicken broth. You can use vegetable broth if you are uh, serving a vegetarian. And it's a half a cup of half and half. You can also use whole milk. You can use cream. I wouldn't recommend it, it just makes it a little thick. We just want that liquid to help cook the potatoes. So, find your nonstick side, cover this pan, and what's going to happen is, as you seal this, it's going to steam and the potatoes are going to cook. And then we're going to take it off after about 20 minutes and cook it open air in the oven for about 20 minutes and it gets nice and crispy. So I'll add this to the oven. Now, of course, I had one already completed, so we can taste it. And it is best when it gets a, a few minutes to sort of sit and settle. It can be anywhere from 10 minutes to 20 minutes that it just gets to sit out of the oven. And you can see how gorgeous that is. My potatoes got crispy on the top, the cheese melted and caramelized on the top. There's bits of onion. And how delicious does that look? So we'll scoop right into this and get all those bits. If you let it sit a little while, that liquid, if there's any excess liquid, it will absorb into those potatoes. So you can see all the fun layers in that dish. And I should get a fork, but it's so great. Great side dish, make it a meal with a salad, cheese and herb, potato gratin, and I'm excited to show you another recipe using awesome Melissa's produce. We just made potato gratin from my new cookbook, Live Life Deliciously, and I'm excited to make one of my favorite easy dinners. It is chicken, adobo chicken, with a melon salad. So it is so refreshing and quite an easy dinner. Something you can get in the fridge marinating and put together in just a few minutes. So this is going to be a refreshing, delicious, and easy meal. Let's start. I'm going to make an adobo marinade. And you have probably, you're wondering where the chilies are, right? The Mexican chilies to make adobo. But adobo is also a Filipino flavoring. And this one, the Filipino version, starts with garlic and soy sauce and citrus. So it's very different than a Mexican adobo. And I think it's super versatile. So I'm starting with some garlic and this marinade has three cloves of garlic. So those go into a blender. That's the other part is we're gonna blend all of this good stuff together. And about five and a half tablespoons, a third of a cup of soy sauce, which is that nice salty umami flavor, some water, and we'll do a little apple cider vinegar. Now you could absolutely add a different vinegar if you wanted to. Vinegar adds that nice acidity. Um, and apple cider vinegar has a bit of a sweetness to it, so I like it, it's a little more mild. I think it's great in this recipe. And a couple of tablespoons of fresh lime juice. So important to get that bright citrus in there. The other thing I love doing is adding the aromatic zest from citrus to a marinade because then you're not putting it right in your mouth, but you get the oils from the citrus zest imparted into the, the meat and the chicken. So I'm just going to zest one or two limes. You want about, let's see, one teaspoon of lime zest, and that will go into the marinade as well. And I have a nice fine microplane grater here that I zest my citrus with. So we'll get a teaspoon now this adobo is, like I said, so versatile. I use it on 
pork tenderloin in the cookbook, you'll see I have an adobo marinated pork tenderloin recipe. Easy, you can do it on the grill or in the oven, and that citrusy, strong soy flavor is so great. So there's one more ingredient I add, a little aromatics. I put a little dried oregano in this adobo sauce. So it is, let's see, it's about half a teaspoon of dried oregano. That goes right in and then we get to blend this. So hang on while it gets noisy. What blending a marinade does is you saw that I put all of that delicious garlic in and that blends the garlic into a puree. So I am going to pour this marinade into a bowl. You can do it in a Ziploc bag. You can do it in a bowl, either way. And then I have my, my small chicken breasts. This can do four. I have three right here. One serving is about three ounces if you want. If you're a big eater, four ounces of chicken. So cutting a large chicken breast in half is perfect. Um, you can put three or four in here. Let it marinate for two to five hours. You don't want to let chicken go overnight. That's too long in an acidic marinade. But this one will go right into the fridge. I have a little drip there. And the great thing is I already have some made, so this will marinate and then it gets grilled. So on to one of my favorite parts of this dish is the melon salad. And I'm using three different kinds of melon. You can just use one. The flavors are great with just one kind of melon. Um, but I love, I love the variety. So I have watermelon, cantaloupe, and I'm gonna use honeydew. Um, Start by, you don't need too much melon for this salad, so you're not going to need a whole melon of each one. So I'm just going to cut the end off, I'll show you my trick, so that it lays flat, and then cut, oh, a half to a third, depending on how much you want. And I'll set that melon aside. Same thing with the watermelon and the honeydew. This is a beautiful mini seedless watermelon, which I love. It's great for a dinner size, small family. And then I'm just going to cut about, I don't know, a two inch strip of that watermelon. We won't even use all of that for this salad. Put that over here. Now, let's do the rind. So this is my favorite trick, is just cutting the rind off. Instead of cutting it into slices, and then cutting the rind off. This is an easy way to get a lot of that rindless fruit quickly. Our cantaloupe, let's take the seeds out of that. Easy to scrape those out. And you have that nice center. And your cantaloupe and your honeydew, you can absolutely cut into wedges and then slice it. What we want to do is create beautiful slices of melon for our salad. And as I've talked about, I work a lot in, in food styling. So I am very aware of, hey, how can I make this dish look beautiful as well as taste good? And so that's part of it, is just figuring out how my melon is going to look best for this salad. And part of that is three colors of melon. Look, already we have so much beautiful color here. Our platter will be amazing. That other tip I had, sharp knife, always wonderful for cutting through melon, squash, things like that. Keep your fingers out of the way and cut through that melon. Beautiful. That is a gorgeous melon. Look how pretty these colors are together. I love it. Turn that over, get our rind off. Now, how can you tell if a melon is ripe? For watermelon in particular, you want it to be heavy, 
oftentimes you look for that yellow spot on its underside and that is a telltale sign of a nice sweet watermelon and then there's always the tapping trick so you don't want it to sound you want it to sound kind of like a drum and that those are your signs for a nice ripe watermelon with cantaloupe and honeydew definitely you don't want it to look too green or feel too rock hard you can do individual servings or uh, family style and the nice thing cut this melon however you like cut it into wedges cut it into slices it doesn't matter we're just going to arrange it beautifully and get some of those delicious toppings on the top so you'll want a little of each melon if you're only using one or two kinds of melon totally fine and I love doing this in chunks and slices. Just make it look pretty on your platter. This smells like a really delicious cantaloupe. I can smell it. I wish you guys could. So pretty. Look how easy it is to arrange this. I just want to put it all over the platter and then my watermelon will follow. And it's this beautiful tri-color situation right here. And watermelon, I kind of love cutting it into thinner slices. It's kind of fun to eat and it absorbs all the flavors from the toppings and the dressing. So those slices, I'm just going to cut them into little smaller pieces and arrange those on the platter. So pretty. Get that under there. This is easy. We just made this beautiful melon salad that we're going to top with our chicken and feta and pistachios. So great. Now let's, I'm going to move this melon and then we'll get our chicken ready. And look how gold, like it's just, it's caramelized. That adobo with the citrus and the soy really adds such a beautiful lacquered color to this chicken. And you can slice it or leave it whole for serving, whatever you would like for your guests. This is so pretty. The adobo marinade that was on this chicken, guess what, you don't throw it away. So I took the adobo marinade and cooked it on the stove for about four to five minutes and simmered it. So it becomes food safe and it, it plays a dual role. It's the marinade and the sauce slash dressing for this beautiful dish. So I'll show you how that goes on in just a minute. My marinade has simmered on the stove for a few minutes and it's reduced down. It's thickened just a little bit. I can smell it. It's nice and strong. So I just need a little drizzle over this. I'm just going to put that over. The citrus plays with that melon so well. And the best part, you add a little bit of feta cheese and crunchy pistachios. So also a note, in that citrusy marinade, I added a little bit of brown sugar as I simmered it. And that sweetened it, it made it a little bit more almost syrupy, but this sharp, salty cheese will play into that. It's so lovely. And a little bit of pistachio. And look how easy that melon salad and adobo chicken came together. It's one of my favorite um, meals. It's so easy and fun. Look at this beautiful mint. You definitely want some mint on this salad. Could you use another herb? Absolutely. You could do basil, something delicious and tender. Maybe a Thai basil, purple basil, regular. But I'm so glad I didn't forget the mint to add such a nice fresh flavor. Oh, beautiful. And you can smell it. I love it. Thank you to Melissa's for having me. Thanks for joining me and making these beautiful dishes from my cookbook, Live Life Deliciously. I am Tara from TaraTeaspoon.com and so happy to cook with you.